Thank you very much. So as you said, my name is Adam. I've got a slight problem. I'm obsessed with electron microscopes. And the idea of this talk is to share a bit about how those work with you today. So we're going to talk about two types of microscopes today. The first one is a transmission electron microscope, or a TEM. A transmission electron microscope shines electrons through a sample and then projects that onto a phosphor screen below to produce an image. And the other type is a scanning electron microscope. A scanning electron microscope scans an electron probe across the surface of a sample and then uses the electrons that come back off the sample and, that, uh, and other data to produce an image from the sample. So starting out with TEMs. TEMs are really cool and really amazing, but they are a very specialized tool. If you need a TEM, you're going to know that you need a TEM before you even started. Uh, they often require complicated and hazardous sample preparation things. You have to have the samples very, very thin, which we'll get more into later. But they do yield some amazing data. That data comes at a cost of complexity, though. You have to be able to keep the image information through an electron beam through a whole bunch of different electron optics. There's 43 different electron optics inside of that column right there. Almost every single one has to be perfectly lined, and every single one has to be manipulated to generate your image. So not a tool you want to use every day. However, the data they produce is incredible. We can make atomic resolution images, we can take pictures of viruses, we can extract electron diffraction data, and we can even, with some really specialized tools that if you want to learn more about later, talk to me after the talk, we can reconstruct the interconnections between neurons in a brain at, a, at such a level where we can see where they touch. And doing that requires a lot of complicated tools. They're not really as suited for us. But if you ever come across one, you're going to be preparing your samples on grids like this. That's a three millimeter copper grid. You have to suspend a 70 to 150 nanometer thick sample on top of it just because it has to be that thin for the electrons to go through it. And getting a sample that thin in a controlled fashion involves like diamond knives or ion beam milling or all sorts of crazy technologies. And you also have to have the sample produce contrast. So to do that, you use something like osmium tetroxide, which is uh, basically a heavy metal stain. It is designed to stain tissue with heavy metals. If you get it on you, it will give you heavy metal poisoning instantly. Not desirable for our community. So we're going to move on to a scanning electron microscope. So this is a beam diagram on an electron microscope, and you can, or a scanning electron microscope, or SCM. And you can see it's quite a bit simpler than the TEM. We start out at the top with an electron gun. Uh, it's a tungsten filament. We heat it up really hot. The electrons start boiling off the surface. And then we extract electrons using uh, about a 30 kV power supply. Uh, we send those through a condenser lens and condenser aperture to form our beam. And then we send it through scan coils to scan it across the surface. And then we take this beam that is scanning and we focus it onto the surface of the sample using the objective lens and objective aperture. Once the beam strikes the sample, some electrons are given off by the sample. A electron detector of some sort picks up those electrons and transmits, and transmits them to the screen. Using the scan coils, we scan the beam in a raster pattern across the surface of a sample. And then at every point, we record how many electrons come back off of the surface of the sample, correlate that to brightness. And so as we scan, we make the beam brighter or less, or le brighter or less bright on the CRT, and we're left with an image. So let's talk about where the electrons come from in an SEM. Uh, we start out with secondary electrons. Secondary electrons are knocked out of, or knocked out of the sample by the primary beam. Uh, they come from the surface of the sample, and they come from a relatively small interaction volume. So they're very high resolution and really good for studying the surface of a sample. Um, the other type of electrons we're going to look at today are backscatter electrons. Backscatter electrons are primary beam electrons that are elastically scattered back from within the sample. And because of that, they can carry more chemical information with them, because uh, atoms with a higher atomic mass will reflect more backscatter electrons. So we can use this to determine some kind of chemical properties of the sample, or if we just want to see a little bit deeper into the sample, we can use those backscatter electrons, because they do come from that much larger interaction volume. And the last thing we're going to look at is characteristic x-rays. When you ionize something and, it fall, and the ion falls back down to its ground state, it gives off an x-ray. And in the case of most materials, it gives off a characteristic x-ray that using a special sensor, we can actually determine what material is giving off those x-rays. Therefore, we can determine what material the electron beam is hitting, which is useful in a variety of different fields. So this is a comparison between a secondary electron image and a backscatter electron image. So the, the low voltage secondary electron image, we can see it's a lot, there's a lot of details on the surface we can see. We can see kind of the pity in the right-hand side. Um, everything's kind of the same color, though, and you can kind of get some contrast around the edges. But if we look at the backscatter electron image, which is actually the exact same part of the IC, just image using a different technology, we can see further into the IC, and we can see that there's all these little bright white spots, and those spots are so bright because they're tungsten. They're tungsten vias in the IC. 
tungsten has a higher atomic number, therefore it shows up brighter on the backscatter electron images. So using different detectors or even combining them together, you can gather a lot more data about the sample than just what the surface of it looks like. In this case, we're actually penetrating into the sample to see it. So let's talk about the characteristic x-rays. To gather, to look at the characteristic x-rays, you need something called energy dispersive spectroscopy, or EDS. So this is an example EDS spectrum. We see here we got a peak for iron over here, right around, right past six keV. And we've got another peak for oxygen over here. Um, and the, the K alpha next to it just means it's the x-ray that comes from the, kind of the outer layer of that atom. And so using that, we can tell, yeah, we probably have some rust on the surface of whatever the, whatever the sample is, because iron, iron oxide. The other really cool thing you can do with EDS is make a map of a sample. And the way you do that is we'll start out with a backscatter electron image of the sample. So you can see we've got some bright spots here, so we know we have something heavy. Everything else is pretty dull. And there's nothing really in the background of this. So this is an AMG 8833 thermal camera. This is about one pixel on it. And let's start looking at the, the EDS information from it. So we can see here, yeah, we have a lot of silicon everywhere. That's not a big surprise. It's a device built on a silicon wafer. Below that, we've got some nitrogen and oxygen, or sorry, uh, yeah, nitrogen and oxygen. So those are gonna be uh, various layers that are growing up on top of the silicon. And then below that, we can see we've got quite a bit of aluminum and, and titanium that's focused on those really bright spots um, in the back set of electron image. And that's not surprising at all. Aluminum is commonly used as a conductor in a semiconductor, and titanium is used to get the aluminum to stick to whatever you want it to. And then we can also see we got the EDS spectrum that you saw on the previous screen. So now we can see that we can kind of combine backscatter and EDS and start reverse engineering some stuff with it too. So sample requirements. You can't just put anything in an electron microscope. It's gotta, gotta be a bit special. The surface of it should probably be conductive. If it's not conductive, the electrons are gonna get stuck in the surface of the sample and it's gonna charge up. And when it charges, you're gonna get all these weird beam effects. Your images are gonna get really fuzzy, really blurry. So you need to make it conductive somehow. And the way you normally do that is with a sputter coater. So a sputter coater, which is right here, ionizes argon, slams that argon into gold, and then the gold uh, leaves the target and it gets deposited on the surface of your sample. And so that's what you can see in this last image here, um, that the gold has covered all of the samples. So we now have a very conductive layer, which is gonna be great under the electron beam. The samples also need to be stable under high vacuum and the electron beam. The electron beam is, in some ways, the radiation of a nuclear blast concentrated down to a couple nanometer spot hitting your sample, and the hope is not to damage anything. Good luck. Um, this is what happens when you get too powerful of an electron beam. That's the eye of a fly. Um, there was a slight miscalibration in the instrument, so I pressed a button to try to make the image brighter, and then the, the surface started boiling off because the beam was literally melting it, um, which kind of ruined your sample integrity, but meh, it's, it looks cool. Um, so a, a dry sample is a happy sample. In an electron microscope, the entire thing is held under a very, very high vacuum. Any moisture inside is gonna wanna escape, and that escaping moisture can cause you problems in all sorts of different ways. So you gotta dry it out somehow. And when you're drying it out, you wanna be careful not to deform your sample too much. Uh, you can dry it out using things like a critical point dryer or literally just freezing it and then letting it sublimate out really slowly. Um, and the thing is that all these rules can be fudged somehow. Uh, you've got things like cryo SCM, low vacuum mode, or just being clever with the beam. Cryo is where you literally keep everything inside the microscope at liquid nitrogen temperatures. And when water's at liquid nitrogen temperatures, it actually doesn't sublimate nearly as fast. So you can maintain a piece of ice held with liquid nitrogen inside of a high vacuum chamber, which is pretty impressive. And this is great for keeping your sample intact. Um, the hobbyist scopes tend not to find this very often, though, because it's a really expensive setup. So we're hackers. We can figure this out. So you take a block of aluminum, you freeze it, and then you put that in the microscope. And that stays cold enough long enough to keep your sample at liquid nitrogen temperatures. So now you've just recreated a $100,000 device with, like, scrap metal. Um, you can also use low vacuum mode where you kind of degrade the vacuum inside your specimen chamber. That's going to be something you're going to have to kind of find in your instrument, or you're going to have to find one with because that's a very specialized piece of equipment. Um, or just being clever with the beam. You can focus somewhere, and then you can really quickly move the beam somewhere else to where you actually want to image, and then try to gather data as quickly as possible so you can minimize the amount of damage the beam does to the sample. So there's all sorts of ways of being clever with it. Um, other than that, you just, it's, you just got to learn about it. Um, anyways, that's my talk. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to ask me afterwards, or if you want to try and get one of these things for yourself. Um, this, is, this was just to kind of introduce you to what you can do with it and technologies that are available, and I hope that you all go and explore this field. These microscopes are out there, and you can get them for surprisingly good deals, because it's surplus equipment from universities. I mean, what could be better for hackers? Like, come on. Well, anyways, that's my talk, and hope you all have a great day.